Welcome to another session on pediatric fractures. The session today is going to be fractures of the femoral shaft in children. And as you know, there, uh, there's a lot of difference in children versus the adult and the way they're treated. Now, really to understand these injuries, you really have to have an understanding of the muscle forces on the fragments. And that's why you take anatomy in medical school and you have to review it when you're in orthopedics. So, here we have a fracture. It's got a deformity. What are the deforming forces uh, producing this deformity? Well, you have flexion and um, external rotation. Okay. And you got external rotation. And Why do you have that? What, what is it that causes that? Because of the psoas muscle that's, that's right. now unopposed. Yes, yeah, right. The, the main one is acting on that. Um, when you have a fracture, you lose the ability or the, the extension uh, mechanism and so you have uh, everything is on the proximal fragment and we call this the king fragment because there's non-operatively there's really no way that you can change that or control or control that and so the psoas the primary one uh, affects on the pro proximal fragment and it produces flexion and external rotation and as we see here, when we talk about the treatment of these, we have to realize that that's where that fragment is, and we have to take the distal fragment and get it to come up and be in the same alignment with the proximal fragment. Okay, sometimes you'll see this. What muscle forces are causing this? The adductors? Well, abductors. Well, you're right. The adductors are having some of it. But the primary thing is that the abductors laterally pull it up into somewhat of a varus, a neck has come at somewhat varus position. And then you see, as you said, the adductors really are pulling on the distal fragment. And actually that's what's causing the angulation. And you have to understand that because if you put this in large abduction, you'll stimulate the adductors and actually increase the angulation, that's the old standing adductor paradox. So, here we go, most of them have shortening. Why do they have shortening? What are the muscles involved here? Your hamstrings? Yes, what else? Your quads? That's right, it's a combination, combination effects of the hamstrings posteriorly, which are actually two joint muscles, and the quadriceps, and it's also a two joint muscle. Uh, it doesn't really attach that much to the femur, but it attaches a lot more to the proximal tibia through the patella. So, we said that we say that uh, femoral shaft fractures are different in children. When do you expect that you see them? When, from, well, so you have one peak in childhood that's like from two to five, and yes. then you have another later. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, there's one peak is early, and that's, why do you see that? Because What's, kids are just starting to walk, and so they're... Yeah, they're walking, they don't have a lot of uh, balance mechanisms at this point, and they're usually due to falls. And usually it's a twisting, they'll get their foot caught and they'll twist, and that's why we see a lot of spiral fractures in this age group. Now, what about the late one? Why do you see that? Those are high energy mechanisms. That's right, it's usually major trauma, like hit by a car, um, in sports and so forth, or in a car wreck. So, we determine treatment based upon, what, what do we determine, how do we de determine what treatment we're gonna use? Um, you can base it on displacement. Well, what else? Uh, yeah. Age. Age, or that's age. right. It's determined by the patient's age. And so what respect, how, what are the different age groups that we think of? Um, up to six months. Yeah, there's five distinct age groups. And the first one is infants, neonates. Actually, that can be up to until they're, they're really walking. And then young children, what's the next one? Would be adolescents. That's right. Actually, a little bit older children, they're a little bit different. And we'll talk about why and what the muscle force is and what the methods of treatment are. And then young adolescents, and then of course, actually young adults which are really skeletal maturity and we treat them just like on the basic principles of treating adults. So 
This patient here, it's a 10 month old, and he presents with this injury. And you ask the parents what happened, in 10 months he's not gonna be running down the hall, and they say he fell out of bed. So what do you see here that disturbs you? On the left, there's a femoral shaft fracture. Yeah, but what is the fracture pattern? Was it a, a bending or a oh, twisting force? Twisting. That's right. It's a spiral fracture, which is characteristic of twisting. And you have a definite spiral fracture. What else do you see? On the right, it looks like a green stick. Yeah, there looks like there's a little small fracture, a possible mid-shaft fracture. And so instead of this injury, what we have are these injuries. So what, what is your concern here? Non-accidental trauma. That's exactly right. It's always considered non-accidental trauma if it's in the pre-walking age. If they have a spiral fracture in the walking age, the chance of it being non-accidental trauma is quite low. But it's in the pre-walking age, it's a pretty high incidence. So how can you confirm this? This. So the patient shows up three weeks later for a follow-up examination. What is it about this that tells you that this was neglected for a while? It's significantly shortened. Well, it's, it's shortened more. What else? What's all that stuff around the bone? What does that indicate? A lot of callus. That's right. And why do you why do you have a lot of callus here? Because there's a lot of motion at that. That's pressure. right. Exactly right. You have proliferative callus and it's secondary to motion, and that created an excessive hematoma, and this indicates that it was uh, prior to the treatment. Okay. On this side, what do you see here? I see like periosteal healing. Yeah, uh, we see here a periosteal. So what does this confirm? We, we you thought there was a second fracture in the other femur. Was there? Yes. Yes, and this confirms that there was a periosteal bone, which confirms there was a fracture in the femur. When you have two, more than one fracture, again, this diagnosis is now confirmed as non-accidental trauma. Okay, now, we're gonna see a child, an infant, up to about a year of age uh, pre, kind of a pre-walking age. What are the alternatives of treatment? A pavlik harness. What else? A what what would we cast. use, huh? A spica cast? Yeah, a spica, immediate spica. And this is what we use for years and years, is immediate spica. And what's the problem with this? Have you ever tried to put one on a, on a six-month-old? Having to clean the child? Well, you got a very short lever arm here where you can do any molding. And so the advantages are, it gives you, it's really a little bit more supportive. It's pretty supportive. And it has less, for that reason, they have less spasm. But the disadvantages are, well, usually requires a general anesthesia. You can put them on under local, I mean under uh, sedation, but you don't like to sedate this age group. And if you put on them without that, there's a lot of screaming and hollering. And you can't really put on a good mold with it. And it's hard to keep clean. You have to change the diapers. And it's really difficult to apply well because you have such a short lever system here to mold it. And parents are not very happy with it. And if the mother is um, <clears throat> it's a little bit difficult for the mother if she's breastfeeding for the child to, to breastfeed a child that's in a spike of cast. So, what kind of treatment is this? This is something we use for many years. What kind of treatment is this? Traction? Yeah, but what kind of traction? Mm. Do you know? Um, not the split. Not no, the no, no, no. This is, this is Brian's traction. And it's very effective. Is this appropriate for this age group? We used to say you could use Brian's traction if they <clears throat> don't, don't weigh any more than 30 pounds and they're, more, they're less than a year. But <clears throat> it's probably not nowadays. You've never seen Brian's traction used, have you? How about you? Mm -hmm. No, we don't use it anymore. And why? I 
read it's dangerous, but that's I'm right. Not sure why. There's there's a lot of reports in the recent literature of complications, even when you go by the rules of 30 pounds and so forth. And so, why do you have a kind of complication rate? What is it that causes that? Well, first thing you have, you get hyperextension, and that will cause cause some vascular spasm. The other thing is that you kind of decrease the blood flow because you have to put on fairly tight uh, ace bandage to hold it there. And also, the older they get, the more pressure it takes to get blood up to the uh, extremities. So, there's a possible alternative. What are we using nowadays? You mentioned it before. Um, Padlock harness. That's right. You can use modified Brian's traction, but I don't know of anybody that uses this. This was written in a, uh, years ago. It was modified, and what you do here, you decrease that hyperextension, and that helps to relieve some of the arterial spasm. But again, you still have the same problem that you can get with a um, um, <clears throat> lack of blood flow, even though you do this. So, what treatment is the most usual? What are you using now? Uh, up to six months. Yeah, the pavic harness. And it depends on how big the child is. You can actually use it maybe up to nine months, even I've used it as, early, as late as a year. So, what are the guidelines for using a pavic harness? What's the advantage of it? It's easier to keep clean. Yeah, it's simple and it's certainly cheap. Um, and usually doesn't require sedation. You can put it on without sedation in the emergency room. And the hips are hyperflexed. Why? What's, what's unique about that? What's the position of the hips when the patient's intrauterine? Uh, flex. Yeah, there are very few children that are intrauterine in the standing position. <laughs> so the hips are hyperflexed and so they have some shortening of the psoas muscle. So again, you have to um, get to that proximal fragment. You can't uh, extend that. And the hip is externally also externally rotated, as we talked about usually the psoas and the abductors causing this. But when you do that, you need to provide some type of lateral support, otherwise they'll go into somewhat hyperabduction. The disadvantages are what? It's not as stiff of a construct, so there's uh, That's true. less support, they have more spasm. Yeah, and they should, you need to warn the patient, parents, that this patient is going to be a little uncomfortable for the first two or three days, and that kind of bothers them a little bit. That's why it's very important that you have, you put them in kind of a little trough so that you provide lateral support to keep that from going out. And it takes a while for them to get any fibrous callus, so when they move, they'll have some spasm. And some people have criticized this use because of the initial spasm. But afterwards, the initial discomfort, the treatment's well accepted, and as you can see here, they can carry them and they can bond with the child and the mothers can do their breastfeeding. So it allows bonding with the patient and them to be carried around. So. What's the national posture in the infants you just told me? Uh, flexed. That's right, the hip is flexed. Uh, that's because that's the way it was in the uterus. So, what happens if you don't account for that? Then you get the apex anterior? Yeah, right. Here's the one that they, they thought they'd put a cast on. First place, the cast is not long enough, and so it's hard to put a cast on and, and control that proximal fragment. And so what you have here, now, this is what happens if you put them in the pavlic harness, you can get them, the lower extremities in, in flexion, and you can pretty well align that, as you can see here. Even with displacement, the healing is usually complete and rapid. And here you can see it. Um, we used to say that in infants, if you get the bones in the same extremity, they'll heal. Now. What's the useful treatment for the young child? Where, what are you using? Once they get older, you can't use the pelvic harness. What's the popular treatment now? Uh, spiky cast? Yeah. Well, what about internal fixation? Do you use that? You well, sure. no, but occasionally it's indicated. Um, if you have bilateral fractures or 
um, you're going to transfer the patient or something. Occasionally, you may want to do internal fixation. And I think more and more people are actually using internal fixation in the uh, even in this four to three to four year age group. Uh, what about external fixation? Have you ever seen that in this age group? I haven't. Yeah, it's a little. The, the fixator usually weighs more than the child. Again, though, there's occasionally indicated, and we'll show an example of that. What about traction? Yeah, it's very. Have you seen it on the ward? Not in a Not child. Not anymore. When I was in my residency and early when our in practice, the ward was full of kids in traction. We'll discuss that. What about immediate spica? Yeah, that's the most common thing in this age group. So let's look at the basic principles of traction. Whose traction is this? What kind of traction is this? This is an old picture from an old textbook, but it was a popular method of traction. And this was Russell's original traction that's used about this. What's the problem if you use this kind of traction? The skin blisters? Yeah, right. We have five pounds here, and it puts five pounds in that direction, but you gotta have a counter traction that here. So what's your total force on it? 10. Yeah, so you're right, you say it applies too much tension on the skin. How much can the skin tolerate? How much weight? Well, no more than about seven pounds maximum. If you get more than that, you start getting skin problems. So how do you decrease the tension on the skin? What do you do? What do you use? You can um, use balance traction. Well, it's balanced, but you split it. You use this split muscles traction. Is this the, is this the, what's the problem here? If they put this, they split it. That should be at 90 degrees instead. That's of right. It doesn't. The vector, the, the vector in traction, you want it to be in line with the femoral shaft. And if you put your uh, <coughs> uh, sling right over the femur, it doesn't do that. So the sling needs to be behind the calf. So this is not the proper approach. So here it is, what you do, you need to put it right behind the calf, and that's where you need to put it. And when you do that now, the vector is in line with the shaft. What's the other advantage? Well, you've, you have just now five pounds here, so you split the traction. That's what they call split Brussels traction. And if you're going to use traction, this is the, probably the appropriate method. You decrease the tension on the skin by a half, and so that's the part. And it also gives a little bit better alignment as far as the femur is concerned. Sometimes gravity will make the femur um, go posterior, and what do you do to counteract that? Well, if growth goes posterior, what do you do? You put a pillow there, and that kind of hopefully will correct that. You can also put a third sling there if you want to, to kind of help character, and that doesn't really apply to the traction, but it just kind of keeps the femur aligned and gets that posterior bow. So, What's the problems with associated with split Russell's traction? What's happened here? Uh, yeah. Sheet slid down. That's a, the sling. This was sling was originally up here, and the kid was up here. This patient was up here, and he slid down, and so now that's not providing the right uh, uh, alignment. And here, you don't have anything. Uh, you can see this is. Uh, not here. So, <clears throat> so the other problems associated with it, this is the subsequent position. What does this tell you when the child starts doing this? They're uncomfortable? Well, actually, they're, they're, they're comfortable because it's a sign that the fracture is healing because when he doesn't have any pain, he'll start moving around. What's the problem here? Well, it's kind of come apart. This was the traction apparatus here, and it slipped up, and this thing was supposed to be right here, and now it's in full extension. And so that's why we don't use traction anymore, because it needs to be checked constantly. You have to check it every day, because when they start to move around, it'll be altered, and you have to check it. And sometimes you even have to 
rewrap the uh, ace bandage. And the other problem is if you use too much traction or you have trouble with the ace bandage where it slipped down, sometimes it will cause blisters. And once that happens, you really can't get around that. You have to use some other type of, of treatment. And this may be an indication if you've got a high energy and you've got uh, ulcers here where you may have to go to internal fixation with flexible nails. So the advantage of is that it's easy to maintain the alignment and length. It's easy to apply. You can apply it without anesthesia. It's a little uncomfortable initially, but they usually tolerate it. You don't need a general anesthesia. <clears throat> the disadvantages are they have to be in the hospital. And usually they need to be in the hospital about three weeks until you have some callus and internal stability. And then also you have trouble, you got to check them because of traction, you can get a lot of skin problems, which will then alter your treatment. And it's because of that, it's difficult to use in heavy or obese children. And alcohol it has what I call a high fuss factor. In other words, you got to check it every day, sometimes twice a day, because after that child's moved around and everything, we saw an example, and you have to check the skin daily. <clears throat> so, we, at this age, you, you said that you use immediate spica. What are the indications for immediate spica? Uh, Femoral shaft fracture le shortened less than yeah. two. Pros, it's, it's good. You don't have to hospitalize them. You can just keep them overnight to make sure that they tolerate them. It's inexpensive reasonably inexpensive. You can apply with sedation, and some people do, but I think it's easier, it's easier to mold and so forth if you use a general anesthesia. I think most people use the general anesthesia. Has that been your experience? Yes. Yeah. You, some people will use sedation, although sedation is a little tricky in this age group. So what's the cons? What's the, the bad part about it? Well, it can't be used if there's excessive shortening or it's a high energy because they do have a tendency to even shorten more. If it's greater than two centimeters of shortening, then you need to be a problem. And I don't have a picture of it, but the other thing you can do to see how stable it is, you can do what we call the telescoping test. Under um, image intensifier, you telescope, and if it goes more than three centimeters, you know there's no internal stability and you probably can't use it and you have to go to another method. And this may be a situation where you might want to use uh, either an X-fix or intermediary nails. And for instance, if you've got a high energy injury, this can be a problem. So it does require attention to details and you do need to follow them up because they may be some delayed shortening or there can also be delayed um, thing. So to be effective, you have to put the extremity in the position of maximum relation of the muscles. You, you want the muscles relaxed because if they're spastic or they're under tension, they will then cause some late deformities. So what is the optimum position for most shaft fractures? Do you know? Um, so it's like 30 to 40 degrees of hip flexion, um, and then you want the knee flexed at about 30 degrees, yeah. then you want it um, abducted well, a little bit. It, it's not a new concept. Actually, if you go back to the really ancient literature by Percival Potman, this is an article he wrote in 1764 before they had, actually, they probably had limited x-rays and certainly didn't have any much in the way of internal external fixation and really it was very difficult to get anesthesia. And this is in England at the St. Bartholomew's Hospital. And this is how they used to treat femoral shaft fractures, even in adults. And like you say, you, you need to have some hip flexion. What does that relax? The psoas. That's right. And your hip abduction, what does that relax? The abductors? So, or the yeah, psoas and the abduct, hip abductors and external rotation does essentially the same. And then the quadriceps, you need to have it in minor flexion, not in uh, full flexion. You need to have it in minor flexion. If you put it in full extension, you'll have tension on the hamstrings. 
And so this position really relieves the tension on the major anti-gravity muscles. So what happens if you use the anatomical position? This patient was seen by another physician who really had kind of forgotten his <clears throat> muscle forces. And he said, you know, a child walks and their leg is straight. What's, what's, their, what's the problem here? Uh, you'll get a deformity at the fracture site. That's right. The cast was applied, but it wasn't, it was the anatomical position, but not the position of anterior rotation. And here again, you see that that proximal fragment has now externally rotated and abducted. And so this is what he was when he came out of the fracture. So he was in external rotation plus angulation and if you have external rotation plus angulation, what does that usually cause? A limp? Yeah, right. It will cause some shortening. Also, it will limit some of their internal rotation. And also, to some degree, that bump there will be cosmetically unappealing. So, you told me, what's the ideal position for the affected extremity? Um, flexion. Yeah. And the 430s. Right, yes, you told me. Hip flexion to release the so is hip abduction, external rotation to release the so as, and then about 30 degrees of knee flexion. And of course, it's always very important that you have a bar across here because that helps stabilize it because it actually is a little weak here. And there's some good studies that if you don't use the bar, that this will come apart. So you always have to reinforce it with that. And I like to use plaster because I think I can mold it a little bit better. Some people will use the fiberglass. But the important thing is that you need to do this. What other thing do you need to do if you're putting this on? Where do you put the heel? Well, it has to be that you put some padding behind here because you're actually applying a little bit of pressure here when you apply it. And of course the heel when they're laying like this. And the heel needs to be at the level of the sacrum. If the heel is above, when it comes down the, onto the bed, it'll push the back of the cast into their back and be uncomfortable. So when you put this on, you need to make sure that the heel is at the same leg at the, as the sacrum. Now, you put this cast on and you take an x-ray, this is a uh, cross table AP view and it's got quite a bit of angulation. What are you going to do? He's got apex anterior angulation. Actually, yeah, it's apex anterior angulation. So what are you going to do here? What's happened? Well, you probably put him in too much abduction. So what are you going to do? You could cut a wedge in your cast. Yeah, that's right. You're going to put on a new cast, take it off and put on a new cast. That's a real problem. You put on a really good cast. This is something that we don't really do much anymore. But if you can just do a wedge, an opening wedge, and here you do an opening wedge, in this position, there was also a little bit of shortening associated with it. And so if you wedge it, that kind of helps get rid of the shortening and certainly corrects the angulation to an acceptable amount. So use a posterior opening wedge. And you need to remember that you can use that even in a spike of cast. And here you can see the wedge that was taken out. We'll talk about the process of wedging later on when we talk about the principles of cast application. Now, <clears throat> we used to put them in a bilateral spikers. But now there's enough people have just gone on to use a single hip spiker with them in that position of abduction and external rotation. And the beauty of this is, look, they can get up and walk around. And so with that, they've got less weakness. When they were in the spiker, when they came out, they would limp a lot and have a lot of problem with it. But you can see with the, the stiffness here with this, uh, unless it's massively shortened, you can put on a, a single hip spiker 
and there's an, a number of studies have shown that that's useful, and that's what I'm starting to use now when I was putting on a cast, a spiker cast. Now, this is a four and a half year old that was hit by a car. What concern do you have? It's shortened. It, it, yeah, it's shortened, and what else? What caused it? It was a high velocity hit by a car. So how are you going to treat this one? I'd probably use flex nails for that. Well, you might use this four and a half, though. <clears throat> well, you an injury film, and it's already two centimeters a shortened, and it's a high energy. So you placed it in an immediate spica. What are you concerned about? That it'll stay shortened? Yeah, because it was high energy, and with that, it's kind of torn the periosteal sleeve, and there really isn't much in the way of of uh, intrinsic stability. And so the patient was, as you said, it may shorten. And so this patient here, they didn't follow up for six weeks, put him in a cast, treated by another physician, treat him in a cast and told him to come back in six weeks. And what's going on? Here, if you measure each one of these, he's got three and a half centimeters of difference. How can you treat that? You could do, um well, actually, what you have to do, you actually almost have to re-break it, and then you can re-establish the length. This was one indication when you use um, uh, external fixator to maintain the length. And that may should have been done initially, or else put them in traction for a couple of weeks until they got some internal stability. So this required surgical lengthening. And so the message here is you've got a high energy injury you got to monitor it closely for late shortening. And if that's the case, then you need to use some other kind of treatment. Like you could use flexible nails, but this is actually, as we see, and we'll talk about flexible nails, it may be a little bit length and stable because it's markedly oblique. Um, or you can use a fixator, or you can actually put them in traction for a, a couple of weeks. Now, how do you know the patient's getting better? They start getting more active. That's right. You can see he's starting to get up and they'll walk or they'll crawl around. And usually you need to tell the parents that they may do this, but that indicates that they're getting better. And so not to worry about it because they get upset if it's up walking, they think it's going to cause problems. But usually that doesn't occur. If it's not got some internal stability, when they move, they'll get a lot of spasm but this tells you that you got internal stability. So, now we get the older child, what are the treatments you can use? Immediate spica? You could, depending, but most on flexible nails. Yeah, well you guys, all you talk about is flexible nails. You mean, you, all you wanna do is operate. <laughs> yeah, so there's a higher rate of shortening. Russell's traction, well, they don't tol at this age, they don't tolerate, they're heavier, takes more motion, and they don't tolerate the increased weight. How about plates and screws? Well, that's, if you get that, you'll get increased overgrowth. You can get as much as two centimeters. It's a large incision, and then you, it's a, you have to come back and take the plate out, uh, because otherwise it'd be a straight razor. So you're right, nowadays, the thing that's really changed and altered the treatment of, of femoral shaft fractures is the use of flexible intramedullary nails. And it's become a very popular choice. Now, <clears throat> what are the alternatives? This is a seven-year-old motor pedestrian victim. And it's too much shortening for immediate spica. Split Russell's traction. Skin probably wouldn't tolerate it. Now, <clears throat> If you're going to apply traction in this age group, how do you have, what do you have to use? Skeletal traction. That's right, skeletal traction. You got to, you know, the skin won't tolerate it. And so where are you going to put the, the traction? Uh, you can put it in the distal femur. That's right. How about the proximal tibia? In adults, you put it in the proximal tibia. What's wrong with putting it in the proximal tibia? The tibial tubercle might close. Early. That's right, very good. Here's one that was two years post femur fracture, and you can see where the pin site was. And if you get a tomogram, 
uh, you can demonstrate that there was a deformity. There's a wreck of bottom that slowed down and that there's now a bony bridge here. So you can't use a tibial pin. So where are you going to put it? The distal femur? Yeah. And how are you going to put it in? Is you put it in with it like this? With the knee flex. That's right. You need to have the knee flexed and you really need to put them up like this. And you can put a pin under local anesthesia, but it's a little bit difficult. And I think it's better to put it under general anesthesia, but some people will put a pin in, but you have to inject down to the bone and you can't really anesthetize the bone very well. So 9090 traction is the best. So, so what's good about this setup? You don't see this anymore, but what's good about this setup? Well, the weights are hanging free. Actually, I like to put the weights inside the bed because people come by to visit this patient and they hit those weights and that stimulates a little spasm. And the weights are hanging free. How much traction you put on there? Well, you got how much weight you're going to put on there? Enough, but not too much? <laughs> how much is enough? Well, you need enough weight to barely bring the lift the buttocks off the bed. And that's usually about the amount of traction that you need. So, yeah, but what's about what's not good about this setup? That requires a lot of equipment. Well, it does that. And it's, you know, it's hard if you have to take them down on the elevator and so forth. You're right. What's going on here? This is a cast. What's the problem here? Where well, you got pressure, that's a no-no. If you're going to treat that, you need to use a sling to hold the foot. Because if you put it in a cast, often you're uh, applying this and you're going to put pressure against the heel and that can cause ulcers. So it's much better to support this with a sling rather than a cast so you can see the foot. It also allows them to start moving their, their leg and their foot. See, and so this one, this patient here, they they used a kind of a little something incorporated in the cast. And so the pin must be inserted with them in flexion. Why is that? So that the IT band doesn't get caught? That's right. Very good. The, uh, it, you know, when you put them in flexion, the IT band is actually posterior where you put the pin, and then that allows them to flex. So it doesn't bind the pin. If you put it in extension, the IT band is anterior and then they have trouble bending the knee. So if you're going to put the pin in, where do you do it? Medial to lateral, lateral to medial? Medial to lateral. Yeah, that's right. You want to go medial to lateral because you want to make sure where the entrance is. And this is what we always say, you go from bad to good. Of course, that's good for philosophy of life as well. So, how much the pin must be inserted? Well, <clears throat> if you put it in extension, then the IT band is anterior to the pin, and it won't let it uh, hang down, and so the in traction, the, the leg will be up in extension, and it drops, the IT band drops posterior to the pin, and that will inhibit knee flexion. So that's why you need to do them with them like this. And that's why I like to do this if I was ever doing it, put them in pin. We don't see traction anymore. When's the last time you saw a patient treated in traction? You haven't I seen haven't it. You've been in third year resident, fourth year resident, you haven't seen it. So we don't see it much anymore. So what's the pros and cons? What's the advantage of skeletal traction? Well, it's safe. It's a good method. It's safe. It's very effective especially 90-90 traction. It lines up the fracture and applies length. It's easy to maintain the length and alignment with traction. What's the disadvantage of it? They have to stay in the hospital? That's right. It's cost. It requires weeks of hospitalization. You can get pin traction infections. And also we found that when we use this, that they get muscle wasting. And they really kind of muscle wasting. And the thought was, when you put them in traction, that you have constant muscle action to kind of counteract the effects of traction. And that required a lot of energy and 
but found that she really had to almost give them as much uh, <clears throat> nutrition as if they had burns because there's a lot of muscle wasting that occurs. And also when you immobilize them, there are some of them start to have blood in their urine and so they'll get renal stones because they're under osteoporosis. So, <clears throat> how are you gonna manage this fracture though? This patient was in a, in a uh, trailer and the father <clears throat> was uh, liked to have a lot of hunting guns and he had them on the wall and unfortunately he had them loaded and the kids were running down the hall and they hit the wall and the gun went down and shot and fortunately the nerves are intact. How are you going to treat this one? You could do skeletal traction for this That's one. That's right. Very good. You can't, there's no plates that you can put on there. Internal fixation uh, pins are not going to do very well. But this is probably the primary indication for traction. And here you can see this patient was treated in traction. And we saw this patient when she was 18 years old and she's done very well. But fortunately at this age group, they have a lot of remolding capacity, capacity to heal. And this way we were able to, to breed the wound, but then put them in traction and it went on to heal well. Now, we're gonna talk about intermeasurely flexible nails in the femoral shaft fractures. What's the basic principle in intermeasurely nails? Well, the basic principle is that you put the nails in. What do you have to make the nails? You have to have spread at the fracture site. That's right. You have to have spread at the fracture site. And they're flexible nails, so they have some flexibility. And so <coughs> when you put weight bearing on them, what happens is those nails then actually expand, and then you get some three-point fixation and you get up here in the proximal tapsis, at the diaphysis, like you say, they need to be spread so that you have uh, <clears throat> realigned the bone, and then you have three-point fixation down here. Now, <clears throat> what types of fractures are appropriate for flexible nail? mid shaft femur with... Um, what ideal, yeah, what else? Um, less than two centimeters of shortening. Yeah, you can use a, a short oblique. A long oblique, if it's got some kind of cortical integrity, a spiral fracture, if it's bi multifocal or bifragmentary, but here you gotta still have some internal stability. And we can also use it for pathological unicameral bone cysts. So, the technique I'm not going to go much in the technique. We're going to discuss this in a later session. Uh, but I think we will mention just some of the basic principles associated with the use of flexible intermediary nails to stabilize the fracture once it's reduced. You need to reduce it. Then you use the nails to stabilize it. So, first you have to determine the nail pattern. Here you can, this is either retrograde or it's anti-grade. So the nails have to, what do you have to do with the nails? Pre-bend them. That's right. You need, the nails need to be bent so that you have the three-point fixation and it has to confirm, conform to the fracture pattern. If it's proximal, then you may need to bend proximally. If it's mid-shaft, you bend in the mid-shaft. And it's distal, you need to kind of bend them. So it depends to conform with the fracture pattern and location so you'll have that three-point fixation. So you need to bend them here before you apply them so that they'll have some flexibility and will reduce the fracture. So, <clears throat> which is the bending pattern to use for retrograde nails? The one on the... The, the right or the left? The left. The left, that's right, very good. And so that goes up like this and provides a three-point fixation. Sometimes you need to use bending pattern. You need to put them in antigrade, and we'll discuss that in a minute, what the indications are. So what's the bending pattern for use for antigrade passage? The right or the left? The right. The right, that's right. You have to have two um, bending here 
And when we talk about the technique, we'll talk about the way that you can apply and get the bending so that you have to do that, you get, that'll give you three-point pressure and spread at the fracture site. So that's what you have to have. And for anti-grade pins. Now, <clears throat> this one here is anti-grade, and this one is the three-point, and the two bends on it, that's retrograde. And you can do that before you put the pin, but you can also, there's a technique to do it as you're putting in the pin. Now, when you pass them, first thing you do is you pass them up to the fracture site, both the medial and lateral, then what do you do? Then you reduce your fracture? Well, you reduce the fracture. You, you really you know, reduce the fracture, and usually you got it reduced at this point. But once you've reduced it, what do you do? Then you pass the easiest one. Yeah, you pass the fracture from the distal into the proximal fragment, and here you pass that up. And once you've got it stabilized, then you can pass the other pin to follow. And notice here, again, we've got the bend. We're getting the bend. The bend is going to end up at the fracture site. So this is the final position. The nail has to be just proximal to the greater trochanter. That's what you need to do to get good three-point fixation. <clears throat> and the ideal final position is this one needs to be where? Anterior, posterior? Uh, posterior. Yeah, it needs to be actually a little bit posterior. This is anterior in the neck, and you can get it up to the physis, at least up to the, just above the lesser trochanter, and you can have it there. And this, you kind of put it a little bit posterior in the trochanter. In the final seating, you can see like this. So the x-rays in the coronal plane, they look okay. You can see that you have, actually, you have good fixation both in the coronal plane and the sagittal plane. But what else do you need to check? Uh, shortening? Well, no, we know that it's a, it's a transverse fracture and it's, it's length stable. What else? What are the three types of deformities? Mm -hmm. You got ang in the coronal plane, angulation in the sagittal plane. Uh, what else? Um, you, c you could have a rotational That's deformity. That's right. And how are you going to check that? Well, you need, about the only way to do this is done by clinical exam and after you put the pins in you need to make sure that the internal rotation should be equal should be at least 45 degrees and then you check the external rotation and it also should be equal about 45 degrees so that the best way to check that is with with rotation a lot of times if it's a little mile rotated when you rotate the fracture, I mean the uh, extremity, you'll feel it kind of click and go back into the proper rotation. Dr. Now, Williams, yes. why, why do you like your pin to end up a little posterior in the greater choke? Well, that's just a little bit better uh, fracture you, to get a little bit better fixation in there. Um, also, it gives you a little separation of the fracture of the pins. You don't have to do that, but it does give you a little bit better fixation. It's a little bit stronger metaphysis. Now, what would you use here? Could you use the, you want to put your ant, uh, retrograde pin on that medial side? No. No, this is a good place. It's not wide to start this, and this is a good way where you need to start an anti-grade nail. And <clears throat> here's another example. You got a very distal fracture, so it's hard to get, you're going to have to bend it there. So this one you can use proximal entrance points, and here you need to put them anterior. The problem here is that you got to spread some muscle, the quadriceps muscle, so it's a little bit more difficult to get this in. But you put the, and you need to make sure that those entrance sites are separated by at least one to two centimeters um, in the <coughs> sagittal plane and at least a centimeter in the coronal plane. Now, what do you do post-operatively? Well, you probably ought to give them a little bit of a splint or a brace uh, and to make sure that the splint goes above the fracture site. <coughs> they can actually start weight-bearing with crutches and they use it for about three to four weeks. 
And then after four weeks, you should have enough callus that they can actually start physical therapy. And then usually people now are removing the pins at nine to 12 months. Why do you have to take the pins out? Because they'll overgrow. If yeah, they well that, yeah, what will happen is if it's a young child and you put the pins just at the proper place, which is the superior pole of the patella, when they, at 10 years of age, where's that pin gonna be? A and, lot higher. Yeah, and what's it immediately higher? That's the, Hunter's Canal. What goes through Hunter's Canal? The nerve. What else? No, not the nerve, what else? The Something. femoral artery. Uh, yeah, that's right. And so then it's gonna be a lot more dangerous and harder to take out. So you need to remove them at nine to 12 months. <clears throat> this is what you don't want to do. What happened here? Looks like you missed the, the fracture distal yeah. segment. Yeah, yeah. Looks like he put it in the fracture site rather than. This is one reason why this one is. What would you? What's the best way to treat this one? Uh, anti-grade nail. Yeah. This would be a one better one that you can use anti-grade nails. And actually, if they're smooth nails, you can actually go through the vices. But this is very difficult to treat with uh, retrograde nails. And so what are you going to do now? Take those out. And, what, and do what? And uh, do an anti-grade nail or Where, what else? internal fixation. Yeah. Or well, you can use an external fixator. This may be one indication where an external fixator is, is used. So, uh, the big problem is that they're length unstable. And people like to use pins because the pins will control it, the angulation, but they don't always control the, the length if it's unstable. In other words, there's not any cortical contact. And so, here's what happens if flexible nails alone are utilized to stabilize on length unstable femoral shaft. Here the x-rays reveal what's going on here. Is this stable length? No. No, he's got a <coughs> fragment there and the surgeon here said, well, we can solve that. We'll just put a third nail. You think that's going to work? No. Okay, it's not a very good choice. The patient came in a week later, came into the emergency room, and if you notice, this was immediate post-operative. This pin was right just at the super, just the super conlar area, and it was under the subcutaneous tissues. The reason the patient came up one week later is that it had shortened and penetrated the skin. And adding a third nail did not con counteract this length and stability. Trained it over and use an external fix here. Now, here's another patient <coughs> with a single, sim similar comminuted pattern, and you got multiple fragments and no cortical contact, and we'd like to use uh, Isen. And what does Isen mean? You know? Elastic. Elastic, stable. Intermediary. Intermediary nailing. That's what the Europeans call it. They call it icin. And you like to use icin because it's good to control angulation. But how are you going to control the, the length and stability? Well, you can do that by just putting a single pin fixation. And that will prevent the shortening. Uh, you, you don't have to put solid fixation here because the pins will control the angulation. But this, this will help control the shortening. And at eight weeks, you can see that it's maintained. And the other technique that is used is the so-called end caps. And these are screwed into the, these are screwed into the cortex right here. And they're fixed so that, the metaphyseal cortex, so that they prevent the pin from migrating distally and provide some stability with this. And you set up the in, uh, uh, end caps, you put the it's, it's put a special inserter and the, it's on, on the nail chuck, and then you put this in and you go ahead and put it in and you screw it in to hold it. 
And here's the final position with the end caps. You see that this one's come down. This one has a little bit of uh, space, but this has prevented shortening here with the, the cut cam. Now, so here's a patient. Is this length unstable? Yes. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's a long oblique fracture and it's kind of length unstable. But this patient did not live here, lived about 200 miles away and was just visiting this city. And we thought it would be nice to put an uh, intermediary nails rather than send them home with an external fixator. And we wanted to use this. So it's a long oblique pattern, it's unstable. And so we utilized, we got it out reduced, and we utilized, you can see here, the end caps, and the length has been maintained. And with, when we sent him home, the, the length was maintained. And here you can see the end caps distally. And then he was followed by another orthopedic surgeon who, in this other town where they lived about 200 miles away, and at four months, the surgeon sent me some x-rays, and you can see that the length has been maintained and he's been providing callus. And here you can see the end caps that are, are functioning. So you can use end caps. Some people will use the uh, Ender's nail and they use an anti-grade, and that's effective as well because the Ender's nail has a place to put some screws in there to prevent it. So. There's other alternatives to managed femoral shaft fracture. You can, these are the ones you can use skeletal traction, external fixator, submuscular plating, a lateral entry rigid intermeasuring nail in older patients. We're using it, and the nails are small enough that people are using it down to about eight to 10 years of age. So what happened here? These were pins that were put in. Well, the pins are too small and they don't have a lot of spread at the fracture site. And here you can see this patient ended up this one. What about here? This one pins had some angulation here, but remember when you're putting them in, you want that bend in the coronal plane. If it slips around when you put it in, it goes into the sagittal plane. It's going to produce an anterior cortex. So it allowed the bow to be rotated into the sagittal plane instead of the coronal plane. And so that's what happened. It's okay, it's in the coronal plane, but if it's in the sagittal plane, it, it's not okay. It gives you a kind of an anterior bow. So it's always important when you put these in to make sure that your, that your angulation is in the coronal plane, I mean the sagittal, yeah, coronal plane rather than the sagittal plane. So what's the best for the patient? Well, you do it within the limits of your expertise and experience. Now we go into young adolescents, 10 to 12. That's a difficult age. And this one is the same as an older child, but traction to cast is too much and less of an option. So what do you use here? Flexible nails. Well, you, that's a little, they don't really tolerate the flexible nails. They're not strong enough. So people go ahead and use intermeasuring nail. And this is a patient that had an intermeasuring nail. Is this how you'd want to put it in? No. No, why? They should have used the lateral entry nail. Yeah. Why? Well, what happens if you put it here? This you is in the trochanteric fossa. You risk the blood supply to That's the That's right. You can, you can risk the blood supply. And we used to do this in kids. It was open. And area people, people thought this was real great, but then when they began to follow up, they found a number of them got avascular necrosis. So if the proximal physis is still open, you can't use this technique. You can use it in adults where you don't have trouble, but if it's open in the child, you don't do it. And so what are you using now? Uh, piriformis, or yeah. a lateral entry stuff. You can use it, put it in trunk and teric insertion, or a lateral entry nail that's a little bent, and you can actually put it in down to here and use that. So here's a six-year-old that had a length, would you say this is length unstable? Yes. Yeah, it's a six-year-old 
It's a little young to put a, uh, a intermeasuring nail. Uh, it's length unstable. Is there another technique that people are using? Submuscular plate. That's right. Very good. And so this is a good example for submuscular plating, and you have to just put it. You have to first and reduce it. First, you need to reduce it, and then you slide this paint. The problem here is that you have multiple scars, and you have to take the plate out. But here's this patient post-operative, and you've got a good fixation, and good solid fixation allows early mobilization. So, the literature. What does it say? when you compare them with flexible nails. This is a six-year-old, what does it say? Well, this is a good study here, um, and what they did, this is in the Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics recently, and they showed that plate fixation of pediatric subtrochanteric fractures is a better outcome with an overall complication rate when you compare it with elastic nails. So they're recommending if it's subtrochanteric or proximal, that the, the um, submuscular plate may be better. So, here's a very complex fracture. This is a patient that had cerebral palsy and had derotation osteotomies and actually had, there was a little problem, and ended up with two plates on this side. And this is a 14-year-old, had post-operative femoral osteotomies, and he fell. The plates were there and he had a stress riser and he fell. What are you going to do now? How are you going to treat this one? You could do another plate, or you could do well, that's a, yeah, I, that's another plate. That's going to be a lot of dissection, doctor. You could do skeletal traction or external fixation? Yeah, external fixation. So, unfortunately, he fell, and so this is five months of the posterior injury, and this is a good technique which you use actually to triangulation in that proximal fragment and then you apply your here and then it's allowed this to heal then once it heals then you come back and take the plates out and it's a lot easier than trying to do it when they have a fracture so thank you very much for your participation and uh, i hope this gives you the basic principles of treatment of femoral shaft fractures in the child as you can see, it's different, and we have different techniques, but thank you very much. Thank you.